Montana PBS presents the Montana Newspaper Association Candidate Debates, the 2014 Race for the U.S. Senate. Support for this program provided by the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communications on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans, and the Montana Newspaper Foundation. From the Library Auditorium on the campus of Montana Tech in Butte, here is moderator Tom Egensperger. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to one of two debates featuring Montana's U.S. Senate and U.S. House candidates. I'm Tom Egensperger of the Montana Newspaper Association, which is jointly bringing you these debates with Montana PBS. I will serve as your moderator today. Up first are the U.S. Senate candidates, and we're going to go right to work. Roger Roots of Livingston attended Eastern Montana College. He holds a Juris Doctorate degree and a Ph.D., and now is teaching at Jarvis Christian College in Hawkins, Texas. Questions for the candidates will be posed by a panel of Montana media journalists. Anna Rao is an investigative journalist at Montana PBS. Frank Mealy is the managing editor of the Kalispell Daily Interlake. And Mike Dennison is in the Lee Newspaper State Bureau in Helena. And we'll get started. Panelist Rao, your first question. Good afternoon, Senator Walsh. Um, earmarks have been extremely controversial in the past, and Congress has had a ban on them since 2010. However, before the ban, Montana was one of the top 10 states receiving earmark money for various projects, including wastewater treatment facilities, hospitals, and public transportation. Would you support a continued ban on earmarks? And if so, how would you secure funding for what you consider worthy projects for the state? Mr. Roots, same question. Uh, I take the Ron Paul position on earmarks. Uh, for years, Ron Paul was a uh, congressman from a particular district in Texas. He was uh, all for budget cutting, budget cutting, budget cutting. He was against pork barrel spending of all kinds. But he occasionally would, would uh, submit an earmark for his district, okay, and he would occasionally be uh, criticized for that. He would often point out that, in fact, what's the alternative to earmarks? You give the executive branch carte blanche to do as it chooses with that budget. Now, those budgets are way too high. I agree with Mr. Daines. It's broken in Washington. We've got to slash those budgets, get them lower, but there's nothing wrong with earmarks. Remember, you can, an earmark would be, would be a way to give an order to the executive branch that the executive branch has to follow. What's the alternative? You let the executive branch do whatever it wants to do. So the president then would just take the same amount of money. Remember, it doesn't change the money at all. An earmark does not change the money that is spent at all, but it actually gives an order to the executive branch, and it binds the executive branch. So I, I don't have a problem with earmarks. I take the Ron Paul position. Thank you. Mr. Roots, you have 60 seconds. Again, the main focus is, shouldn't be so much on earmarks specifically. It's on the spending, the reckless and irresponsible spending of these two government supremacist parties. Both of these men on stage spend like drunken sailors. Some people say that that is a, it's an insult to drunken sailors because at least drunken sailors are spending their own money. These two gentlemen are spending the American people's money. The focus should be on cutting these budgets. And by the way, both of them might spin a tail like they're for balancing budgets and things. Look at their votes. They grow government spending whenever they get a chance. Mr. Daines grew government spending. We sent him to Washington to cut. He didn't cut. We sent Walsh to Washington to cut. He hasn't cut one dime. All he does is grow government. Uh, the next question comes from Frank Mealy. This will be something of a follow-up to that discussion. Uh, Representative Daines, the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution in large measure to limit the power of the federal government. Yet, as we've heard, federal bureaucracies and spending relentlessly proliferate, regardless of the party in power in Washington. Do you think federal government is out of control, or do you intend to support expanding federal spending and programs, as other Republicans have done? What serious measures can Congress pursue to halt or reverse this trend short of a government shutdown? And how do you get the people on your side when it comes to not raising the debt ceiling? Could I remind the audience to hold your applause, please? Mr. Roots, your question? Um, well, uh, with regard to Mr. Dane's claim that he's for balancing the budget. Listen, I'm for balancing the budget. And by the way, I, I would be for a balanced budget amendment. It has to take into consideration the problem of central banking and the Federal Reserve Bank, because they can just churn out 
money to balance the budget. The key is to get spending down. Now, Mr. Daines was, uh, developed a record in Congress. He was only there for two years. And he, okay, just I ask any of you in the audience, count up the votes that he cast. I count up that he added uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in additional spending that he placed on our shoulders. And now he comes and says he's for balancing the budget. Well, he didn't do that in the two years that he was there. He didn't spend in, in accordance to a balanced budget. So. I think that, you know, that, that's the real problem. You can say you're for a balanced budget, but both of these gentlemen spent more than the government brought in. So they didn't balance the budget when they, when they, when they had the chance to cast votes. By the way, you talked about a shutdown. I will never, ever vote to raise the debt ceiling, never under any circumstances. And if it comes to a, uh, you know, some kind of a crucial point where the, uh, the, uh, the administration is threatening horrible things, shutting down the government, understand, shut it down. I will, the, the screams of those in government will be a symphony to my ears. I will keep government shut down until we get those budgets cut. Mr. Roots, your response? Um, in terms of Mr. Daines, uh, again, his, his hawkishness in claiming to be uh, interested in balancing the budget. All you have to look at is what these people do when they're actually casting a vote. Uh, we used to have a congressman named Rayburg. 10 years we sent him to Washington. He would promise to cut government. He would promise to cut government. He would do the same things as Mr. Daines did in just two years. For 10 years, he would come back to Montana in his cowboy boots and say he was for limited government. Then he'd go back to Washington and vote to grow government. Mr. Daines voted for an $800 billion farm bill that's just one example of the things that he voted for, right on our shoulders. And any of you who think the farm bill is for farmers, I'd love to have a conversation with you. It's for farmers in other countries. They pay farmers not to grow crops in other countries to support our different farm lobbies here. Uh, but there's nothing, there is no fiscal restraint from these two government supremacist parties. They just constantly vote to grow government and spend, spend, spend. Thank you. The next question comes from Mike Dennison and goes to Mr. Roots. Good afternoon, Mr. Roots. You know, one of your candidates here, fellow candidates here, has a question whether you should even be here today or at future debates because of racist views that you've uh, written or disseminated in the past. What do you think of that stance, and, and what, are, what are voters to think of your prior race-related writings and comments? Well, let me just say that it is true. I used to be a, I used to call myself a right-winger. I used to be a racist. I used to uh, uh, subscribe to such opinions in my teens and 20s. Uh, I am a high school dropout. I hitchhiked across the country five times before, before I was 20 years old. Um, I've educated myself over the years. I now have a PhD in sociology. I actually teach race relations at the college level. Uh, I teach race relations at the college level at a historically black college. Um, I have a law degree, I have a master's degree. I believe I'm probably the most educated person, uh, I'm a high school dropout, ironically. In this, in this auditorium, uh, if anyone has more advanced degrees than I have, I'd love to meet you. I rarely meet anyone with three advanced degrees. The point is, uh, listen, I've written many letters of recommendation for my, for my African American students. I've, uh, 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 I, I do all I can for people of all races and, and colors and things. It is these parties, by the way, it is these two parties that promote this redistribution philosophy, which is very similar to the philosophy of the uh, hate groups. It's the, same, it's the same exact philosophy, taking resources from Group A and giving them to Group B. The Ku Klux Klan, the Democratic Party, they do the same thing. The only thing that differs is who Group A and Group B is. And now, Mr. Roots, you can have a response. Um, you know, back to the topic of racism and white supremacy and such things. You don't have to travel very far in Montana to find, uh, to find out what a white supremacist government might look like. Just go to one of the federal courthouses here in the state of Montana. After you go through the East Berlin checkpoints, you can sit in the audience during a day when they're processing criminal cases and look at the criminal defendants in that federal courthouse. Remember, Montana is, what, 90 percent white? Not so among the federal defendants that you'll see in federal court in Montana. Disproportionately Native American, probably 50%, 60% Native American. Of course, there's a lot of federal jurisdiction on those reservations. It's also disproportionately black and Hispanic. Um, 
you know, you can sit in the, and you'll watch these strings of Native Americans come in in chains, and they all, you know, they're not even allowed to shower except before trial, which, which never happens. Trials never occur. Everybody has to plead guilty. Um, you know, it's just a spectacle of humiliation of the American people that these parties love to participate in. The next question comes from Frank Mealy, and it goes to Senator Walsh. Senator Walsh, how do you plan to represent the state's interests when it comes to coal, timber, and oil extraction when so many special interest groups affiliated with the Democratic Party are opposed to coal, oil, and timber extraction? Specifically, and to narrow it for all the candidates, do you believe in man-caused climate change, and what do you think about the federal government's measures to counteract it? And considering that Montana has the largest coal reserves in the nation, how do you feel about the new EPA regulations targeting coal energy, and what would you do to challenge your own party to fight those regulations? Mr. Roots, your answer? Uh, with regard to the energy industry, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big proponent of free markets, capitalism. Um, I think that's, that's the, the way to go with the oil industry, the coal industry. Um, I often uh, have great discussions about climate change and these kinds of things. I love reading up on this, all, all sides of these kinds of topics. I love, I love science. I love reading up on it. Um, suffice it to say, uh, what is the solution to any environmental concern, including the, the, the climate change idea? The solution is to unleash the power of capitalism on such an idea, because every time you unleash the power of socialism, I shouldn't even say the power of socialism, the stink and stain of government supremacy, central planning, and socialism, you get more pollution, you get a degraded environment, you get dirtier air, you get dirtier water. When the Berlin Wall came down, which side was more polluted? Which side had cleaner air? It, the cleaner air was on the capitalist side. The cleaner rivers were on the capitalist side. The dirtier air, the dirtier polluted environments were on the communist, the socially planned, the government controlled side. The same is true in Korea. They split Korea in half just like they did with Germany. In Korea, you go there today, the capitalist side, remember, there are enemies of capitalism. There are enemies of capitalism right here in Montana who want it shut down, taxed, regulated, stopped. They would create a degraded environment like you wouldn't believe. Just look at North Korea. Okay. Mr. Roots, your response? Uh, back on climate change, you know, if we unleash the power of the individual, instead of the, the, the stink of government, the individual could solve any environmental problem. There would be people who would, who would be tinkering in their backyards with little spacecrafts and things that they would send up into the stratosphere, clean the air. This is what capitalism does. It cleans things. It makes things better. Every measurement of human well-being improves where there are free markets. Look at North Korea, look at Germany. Two countries where they had the same populations, they cut the countries in half. Half went capitalist, half went communist. The results were identical on each side. Each single time, every measurement of human well-being improves when there is freedom and free markets. The next question comes from Mike Dennison and goes to Congressman Daines. Congressman Daines, welcome. I'm just wondering if uh, you support raising the federal minimum wage to $10 an hour or at all, and if not, should there be any policy initiatives to address the growing wealth disparity in our country? Mr. Roots, your answer? The minimum wage idea is one of the dumbest ideas ever, ever produced in the mind of the regulatory ma uh, man. Um, <laughs> there's an R squared coefficient. There are over 100 peer-reviewed studies in the, in the economic literature that show that raising the minimum wage is correlated uh, with higher unemployment rates. So when you raise the minimum wage, you get more people out of work. Um, you also get inflation. And by the way, it, in, it disrupts the just basics, the fundamental laws of supply and demand. I used to have a professor down at UNLV named Hans Hermann Hoppe, one of the greatest minds I ever, ever, ever knew, um, author of the book Democracy, The God That Failed, great libertarian thinker and scholar. He used to say that anyone who supports the minimum wage is either stupid or evil. It's evil because it harms the poorest more than it harms anyone else. Um, Anyone who claims they believe that the minimum wage doesn't, uh, raising the minimum wage doesn't raise unemployment rates, anyone who claims they believe that 
Let me just tell you, it would be absolutely immoral of you. If you honestly believe that it doesn't raise unemployment rates, why demand $10 an hour? It, it would be immoral of you not to demand $10,000 per hour minimum wage. Immoral, if you don't think that has an effect on unemployment rates. Mr. Roots, your response? Do U.S. senators set your wages? That's the question. I mean, it's that ridiculous. Uh, wages are set by the, the law of supply and demand in the marketplace. Wouldn't it be great if we could just vote for politicians who would go to Washington and raise all of our wages? Wouldn't that be great? Wow! Of course, it's a, it's a joke. It's a mockery. It's a farce. The minimum wage is, is, is one of the stupidest ideas in the world. It disrupts the free market. The free market sets wages. Can you imagine three ugly guys in suits setting your wages for 300 million Americans from, the, from Washington, D.C.? It's that much of a joke. The next question comes from Anna Rao, and it goes to Mr. Roots. Um, speaking of wages and pay, um, Mr. Roots, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, women earn on average 70 cents for every dollar men earn. Studies have shown that occupation choice and education do explain some of this gap, but not all of it. About a third of that remains. The Paycheck Fairness Act introduced in the Senate in April seeks to correct this pay gap, but has failed to gain much traction. Do you believe a pay gap exists? And if so, what would you do about it? A, play, a pay gap does not exist. Uh, you, you said that, you know, when you factor in, I forget the two factors that you factored in, that occupation those... Occupation and education. Level. Occupation and education. Remember, men and women don't seek the same choices in college. Right here in, at this, uh, at Montana Tech, it's disproportionately males who seek, who seek, jo who seek uh, careers and degrees in uh, mining engineering. Those are very well-paying jobs, okay? Disproportionately males go through those kinds of programs, architecture, uh, engineering, those kinds of degrees, and they are more valuable on the marketplace. So she's absolutely right. That explains a good portion of the so-called gap between men and women. By the way, when you look at other factors, she didn't mention there are other factors. There's probably 20 factors. When you factor in every single one of them, women, for, for example, tend to seek jobs with more job security. Males will, will tend to take more jobs that are riskier, more dangerous, more physically uh, dangerous to their health, for example. There is no gap between male and female wages. By the way, if there was a gap, you could make millions. A greedy capitalist could make millions just hiring more women and paying them less. Just think of how much money he could make. There is no gap. It doesn't exist. Mr. Roots, your response? Uh, a couple of economists that I will cite with regard to this question. One is named Thomas DeLorenzo. Uh, and the other is Walter Block. Both have done extensive economic uh, research into this question of whether or not women and men really are paid, uh, there, whether or not there is this gap and women are only paid 77 cents for, or whatever, for whatever a man makes. And they find that when you factor in all of these things, and there's about 20 different factors, the gap disappears. It doesn't exist. And again, if it did exist, you could make millions. Just hire more women and pay them less. It doesn't exist. The next question comes from Mike Dennison and goes to Senator Walsh. Senator Walsh, uh, you're the only Iraq war veteran in the U.S. Senate, yet I don't believe you've ever told us whether you think the war in Iraq was a good idea or has accomplished anything positive for our country or the Middle East. Has it? Was going to war in Iraq a good idea? And what should our Iraq and Middle East policy be going forward? Mr. Roots, your answer? Was going into Iraq a good idea? Absolutely not. We were lied to to get into Iraq. It was a lie. We were told stories by the Bush administration about how there were weapons of mass destruction. It was a lie. We, dis we demonstrated that it was a lie. Uh, we were brought into Iraq under false pretenses. Um, you know, uh, in, even in the broader picture, this global war on terror is a lie. You know, the average American is more likely to die drowning in your bathtub than from a terrorist attack. You're more likely to die from a bee sting than from a terrorist attack. These two parties have built a totalitarian network of surveillance and of control with SWAT teams all over the world. Listen, uh, tanks, bombs, missiles. We've spent a trillion dollars in Iraq. We've achieved absolutely nothing. They've just taken the resources of the American people and they've, turn, they, they, they've 
funded these wonderful, you know, General Dynamics, Raytheon, these uh, great defense contractors. They've made millions off of these, off of the war in Iraq. The American people are impoverished by the war in Iraq. We need to not send any more of our resources into those theaters. We need to bring everything back home. We don't spend enough on defense. We spend nothing on defense. We spend way too much on offense. It's time to get the U.S. military carved back, close those bases, and bring them home. And Mr. Roots, your response? Uh, you know, there was a global poll about uh, where they asked people all over the world. They went all over the world very recently. I think it was last fall. And they asked them, in your opinion, what is the most dangerous, uh, what is the greatest source of danger in the world? Which country on earth is the most dangerous country on earth? Which is the most, the greatest source of insecurity and instability in global affairs? Guess what it was? The United States won going away. It wasn't even close. Second was Pakistan with like 5%. The people of the world, listen, we're, we are drone killing with predator drones. We're flying over other countries. We're surveilling everybody's uh, telecommunications, all in the name of keeping the United States safe from what? Terrorism? Again, you're more likely to die from a bee sting. You're more likely to die from a lightning strike than from terrorism. It's time to stop spending so much money. The next question comes from Anna Rao and goes to Congressman Daines. Representative Daines, despite the House's best efforts, Congress has been unable to repeal Obamacare. Even if Republicans gain control of the Senate in this election, Obama would certainly veto any repeal effort and an override is highly unlikely. Given these political realities and the fact that millions of Americans and 36,000 Montanans have already signed up for the Affordable Care Act, what would you do about it? Would you continue to try and repeal it or would you try to fix it? Mr. Roots, your answer? These two government supremacist parties have destroyed health care. Uh, they have, listen, every one of these huge enactments, Medicare, Medicaid, Obamacare, they all have the same result. They increase demand without increasing supply, causing prices to rise. Health care prices have been rising faster than the rate of inflation every single year for 30 years. Obamacare just adds a little bit more to that. So as, the, as your U.S. Senator, I will work to repeal every single one of those, Medicare, Medicaid, even the requirements that, you know, uh, prescription, the prescription requirement is unnecessary. We shouldn't need to go to a doctor first and then go to the pharmacy. The pharmacist himself is highly educated. Uh, we need to eliminate and deregulate all of these things. We need to legalize drugs, legalize medications, make everything available over the counter. We would bring costs down. If we unleash the power of capitalism on health care, the poorest man in the world could stumble out from under his bridge, bleeding from a thousand open sores. He could stumble into a roadside medical tent and be restored to full health for just forty nine ninety five. If we, if, if we unleash the power of capitalism on health care. You could get a kidney transplant during your lunch break at Walmart and be back to work after lunch, and it would cost you about $69.95. Mr. Roots, your response? Um, I'd like to point to, a, a, there are a couple areas of medical care in this country that are not paid for by any insurance plan and are not paid for by any government program of any kind. One of them is LASIK surgery, another one is uh, breast implant surgery, a lot of facelifts. These are things that you have to pay for out of your own pocket. And guess what? Prices have been going down in all of those areas where you have to pay out of your own pocket. LASIK surgery has been going down in cost and going up in, in quality. The same thing would happen if we unleashed the power of capitalism on every other part of the healthcare industry. Folks, we would live to be 100 years old, 200 years old. Life expectancy would skyrocket. We would heal this nation. We'd be the healthiest nation that ever existed in human history if we just had the guts to unleash the power of capitalism on healthcare. The next question comes from Frank Mealy and goes to Mr. Roots. Mr. Roots, our nation's libertarian streak would seem to argue against any kind of government interference and personal choices that don't have a moral dimension. However, morality has played a significant role in legislation in the past two centuries. Today's political climate seems to be saying that society has no overarching moral interest in such matters as drug use, abortion, marriage, but it does have a moral interest in health care, education, and the minimum wage. Do you believe that state or federal majorities should have a right to legislate on any issues that control other people's behavior, and specifically how? 
I do not. I do not believe that government should be involved in any of those areas you mentioned. All of those areas would, would improve. Our health would improve. Uh, everything about human life would improve. Remember when the Berlin Wall came down? Listen, it was more polluted. The, the, the government supremacists claim that you need government to, uh, you know, government's better for the environment. All evidence shows otherwise. Uh, in Korea, the average South Korean is actually taller. Did you know that? The average South Korean, after 50 years of that split, and remember, they were the same exact society just 50 years ago, the average South Korean is taller than the average North Korean. Their stature, their nutrition is better than the North Koreans. Every time you unleash central planning and socialism on a human problem, you get more problems. Every time you unleash the power of the individual human spirit, you heal, you cure problems. And if we just had the courage to do nothing about so many of these things, we have to have the courage to do nothing. I know it sounds unusual, but if we had the courage to do nothing, you would see the human, the human uh, predicament in this world uh, flower and blossom with abundance and prosperity, we would reach the stars. Instead, these two government supremacist parties keep taking us down the road towards slave plantation ideology and government control. Mr. Roots, your response? Um, you know, I'd like to dis discuss an area that libertarians sometimes agree with each other, disagree with each other on, and that is abortion. Uh, it's one of those areas where occasionally you will find libertarians, even at the Libertarian National Convention, who will take a pro-life position, and they will say, well, they do that because abortion is murder, and therefore it's not really uh, any different than enforcing laws against murder. My response to that is this. Whenever you ask a, a, a politician who claims he's pro-life and who claims he believes abortion is murder, whenever you ask him, well, what should the penalty be for having an abortion? You know what their response is? They'd do anything not to answer the question. If they say anything other than life imprisonment, or the death penalty, they don't really believe abortion is murder, okay? Because if abortion is murder, it would have to be first-degree murder. We all agree on that. It's premeditated. So if they say anything other, this is, I, I constantly am in arguments with some good friends of mine on this issue. Most of my friends disagree with me on this. They are pro, they call themselves pro-life, and they say that they believe abortion is murder. Again, if you say anything other than Mr. the Roots, death penalty or life imprisonment, up. you don't really believe that. Senator Walsh, your response? The we have time for some more questions. So the next question, could you hold your pause, please? We'll be from Anna Rao, and we'll go to Senator Walsh. Senator Walsh, in the wake of the scandals at the Veterans Administration, the Senate has passed a bill allowing for more doctor hiring and for veterans to seek care outside the VA if the wait times are too long. Do you support the concept of the VA as a government-run health care system? And if so, how would you fix it? Mr. Roots, your answer? Uh, the VA system is socialized health care, and it's indicative of what happens to socialized health care whenever you, whenever you create it. That's true all over the world. I often have uh, conversations with people who point to some place, and they tell me, well, that's great health care over there, some, some other country. Great system over there. And they, uh, they frequently point to one of the wealthier Western countries, France sometimes. They'll point to Canada sometimes. But when you go and look... And what really happens there, you find that, well, it's actually more expensive. Uh, there are wait times. You've got to stand in line. Everything is not as good as it, it has been pointed out to be. And by the way, those are the best systems. Go to the worst systems. Virtually every country in the world has some kind of socialized health care. North Korea has socialized health care. Uh, there are horrible systems out there. The VA, by the way, we've, I mean, I believe the, the budget of the VA has tripled. How many of you knew that the Veterans Administration uh, Department is, I believe, the second largest department in the federal government by spending? We are spending so much on that. It's unbelievable what is spent. And it's tripled in, in just a few recent years. And it's indicative of what, you, what happens when you put government in charge of health care. If we unleash the power of capitalism on health care, we'd live to be 300 years old. Mr. Roots, your response? Uh, I would just point out, any of you who want to read up on veteran, the veterans' hospital situation, uh, there are certain things where they can argue they, they were the first to, uh, you know, do an open heart transplant. Several, they, you know, the veterans' hospitals, remember, there are many of them. And so they have several claims that they did this or that thing first. There's a few uh, pioneering things that they did. But compared to what would have happened, if that same system was privatized, if we had the private sector working on that, 
uh, it's not even close. The private sector would come in, do things much cheaper. You'd see people heal faster. You'd see all kinds of innovation and invention. We'd be so healthy, we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. We'd be as fit as Lance Armstrong. We'd be walking around built like Arnold Schwarzenegger. We'll have one more question. It will come from Frank Mealy, and the candidates will be given 90 seconds for an answer only. There will be no response. Frank? Representative Gaines, a lot of politicians who benefit, benefit from campaign spending say that campaign spending is a major threat to our country. Some Democrats have proposed to amend the First Amendment to give Congress the authority to regulate campaign spending. What is your reaction? Mr. Roots, an answer? I think it is a national disgrace that both of Montana's U.S. Senators are formally seeking to amend the Constitution to limit the protections of the First Amendment. How many of you knew that, that government needed even more power? These, our, our two sitting U.S. Senators, Tester and Walsh, are both seeking to give the government even more power than it has right now over what they call campaign spending or what I call political speech. The Citizens United case, by the way, who could argue against saying that you can't ban books and videos? The government actually argued in that case that it had the authority to ban books and videos if even a single line in those books or videos called for the election of a candidate. Who could say that that decision is some radical decision where the U.S. Supreme Court, at least the majority, thankfully, it should have been unanimous, said, no, you're not going to ban books in America. We have a First Amendment. Okay, they say that spending is not, uh, money is not speech. Folks, regulating and controlling the money and the resources behind speech and flyers and pamphlets is one of the most direct ways of chilling and controlling speech. So these people would control so much about politics. They would, uh, they would have McCarthyite hearings. You would be asked, did you write this pamphlet? Who's your donor? All the founding fathers, by the way, used alias names and, and pseudonyms because they were afraid of the government when they criticized the government. Mr. Roots. Um, Mr. Wall. Mr. Roots, your closing remarks. There has never been a good government in world history, and there never will be a good government because good government is impossible. The Founding Fathers well understood this. By the way, any, by the way any, if any of you know of a good government in world history that ever existed anywhere in the world, You'll have to let me know where that ever occurred. Uh, the Libertarian Party used to have a presidential candidate named Harry Brown. Harry Brown used to tour the entire country and he would ask audiences, can any of you name a single federal agency that actually uh, accomplishes its stated goals? Its stated goals. No one could ever come up with a single agency or program that actually accomplishes its stated goals. Finally, he said a woman in one town said, well, what about the Weather Bureau? Everybody had a nice chuckle, a giggle over it, but, th but that actually shows uh, that, that the weather, keep in mind, the Weather Bureau is actually very expensive compared to the private sector alternatives, such as the Weather Channel. The Weather Channel is a private company. It produces better content, more entertaining content, better information, and it's much, 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 much cheaper, and it's voluntary. You don't even have to pay for it if you don't want to. And that's true all the way across the board. There's never been a good government agency. There's never been a good government program. These parties have ruined America. These parties have put so much government into our lives. Listen, a vote for one is as good as a vote for the other. You'll get the same result. Again, we've been sending Republicans, we've been sending Democrats out of Montana to Washington for years. I've watched this for years. We've had Republican politicians who've claimed that they would cut spending. They went and grew spending. There's never been one who cut spending, as far as I know, ever from Montana. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you know of one, you'll have to let me know. Um, Jesse Ventura sometimes compared the Democrats and the Republicans to the gang members in L.A., the Crips and the Bloods. You know, the Crips and the Bloods hate each other's guts. And if one of them sees one of the other gang members on the streets, they may cross the street to physically and violently attack the other, the member of the other gang. And you'll see that among Democrats and Republicans. I occasionally come across either Democrats or Republicans who hate the other government supremacist party. It's part of sort of tribalism. There's something instinctual about it. 
Uh, but those of us who are on the outside looking in, we say, you know, they're really not that much different. And by the way, the current budget that was hammered out, the current federal budget right now that was hammered out between Paul Ryan, Republican in the House, Patty Murray, the Democrat in the Senate, we don't know all the details because it was hammered out in secret, but those two parties began negotiation, negotiating, from what we know, within 1% of each other. I urge you to vote Libertarian in this election. Thank you so much. And thank you. With that, that concludes our debate. I want to thank the candidates, Senator Walsh, Congressman Daines, and Mr. Roots for your frank answers. I want to thank our panelists, Anna Rao, Frank Mealy, and Mike Dennison. Especially want to thank our ta timers for keeping us on track. And the production team from Montana PBS. It's been great being able to work with them. The Montana Newspaper Association for helping to sponsor this debate. And you, the viewers and the audience makers, will hopefully gain some information during this debate that helps you make a better informed decision in the voting booth. And so good night from the Library of Montana Tech. This Montana PBS presentation of the Montana Newspaper Association Candidate Debates was brought to you in part by the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communications on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans, and the Montana Newspaper Foundation.